Good afternoon and welcome to the NetSuite Asia Pacific webinar series. My name is Bianca Edgar, I'm the Senior Marketing Manager at NetSuite. Today we are pleased to introduce Tim Shady, Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. Tim's main focus is on digital business and in particular the technology in everyone's pocket that is driving most digital disruption today across all industries and geographies, the mobile. Tim helps companies in Asia Pacific develop better mobile outcomes for their customers. With a focus across the mobile value chain, um, from internal employee development to external customer or partner facing services, he educates, informs and guides clients on mobile decisions. Today, Tim will discuss how to build a roadmap to guide a digital customer experience. He will cover technology and deployment options, stakeholders and responsibilities to drive customer loyalty and a competitive advantage for your retail business. Now, before I hand over to our speaker, I will just take a moment of your time to introduce NetSuite to you. Founded in 1998, NetSuite has experienced substantial growth with revenues of 556.3 million, which is a 34% growth over the prior year. We have offices in more than 10 countries and have been in Australia for over eight years. Today, there are approximately 24,000 companies and subsidiaries that depend on NetSuite to run complex mission critical business applications in the cloud around the world. Since its inception in 1998, NetSuite has established itself as a leading provider of enterprise class cloud financials and omni-channel commerce software suites for divisions of, larger of large enterprises and mid-sized organizations. <coughs> NetSuite is helping, re helping retailers to run their entire business from a single cloud-based commerce platform integrating e-commerce and in-store point of sale to order management, inventory, merchandising, marketing, ERP and customer service. A snapshot of our current retail customers in the region include Style Runner, Kitchenware Direct, Wine Market, William Sonoma, GoPro and most recently leading surf brand Billabong. I will now pass you over to Tim. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Bianca, um, and good morning or good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so, as Bianca mentioned, uh, my name is Tim Sheedy. I'm an analyst with Forrester. Um, some of you may know Forrester for our uh, research in the, the marketing and customer experience space. Uh, some of you may know us for our research in the technology space, and um, some, some of you may not be aware of the fact that over the last couple of years, we've actually brought our, our sort of our marketing and IT side of our research together as we realize that that's what's going on inside of our clients. As we move into this new digital era, technology becomes part of every customer interaction. Um, and you know, we and you can no longer think about technology and customers as, as separate capabilities. Um, and so we brought them together. And the, the research I am presenting today is a, a combination of some of our uh, research from around the world, from uh, various teams and various analysts, including myself, um, and what I'm hoping to leave you with is an idea of what retailers in region need to do to master that digital customer experience. Um, so starting off <coughs> uh, with a, you know, uh, a good news story is that you know, a, a lot of organizations realize that customer experience is really all we've got left um, when it comes to competitive advantage. That you know, suddenly product plays uh, distribution, you know, all the information, all the traditional competitive barriers are being broken down. And all we have left is a great customer experience that we need to offer our customers. Um, and, you know, the reality is that that is going to be a digital customer experience as I'll be talking about uh, uh, shortly. Um, but the important point is that that's a great customer experience across every step in that customer's journey. And this is sort of the forest of view of the customer journey, and you all probably have a very similar or, um, you know, some of you use the funnel, we've sort of moved away from the funnel uh, approach to the customer journey because we realize that it is, it is a, a circular journey that hopefully the customers come back to you. Um, 
But the, the point is that we're trying to offer that great experience, not just in the buying process, not just in the discovery about our, our company, but as the, your client gets the, your customer gets the product home, um, as they use it, as they, as they have problems, as they want to learn more about your company and more about the service, that, uh, that that is all part of that customer journey that we need to be focusing on as retailers and organisations. So the agenda that I'm going to go through today, I've got, I've got quite a few slides. I'm hoping to get through them pretty quickly. Um, basically, starting off with you know setting the scene that you know the world's going digital, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have already bought into that. Um, Focusing on this omni-channel piece of how we build that business case and then how digital creates opportunities in, in the retail store for those of us who have that, that, re, that retail point of sale. Um, we'll then dig a little deeper into some of the technologies, into the platforms and some of the sort of current and future technologies that are likely to impact us in the retail space. And then finish with a, a few recommendations of what we can do to build that. Um, customer experience delivery roadmap that, uh, that new in, for the new digital world. Now, I, I thought this was a very pertinent quote. Um, if you looked at these sorts of quotes from maybe four or five years ago, um, companies would have said, you know, in, in our business plan that we wrote three or four years ago, things have moved much faster than we thought. And here we have the president of Nordstrom in the US making the comment that the pace of change is accelerating faster than they anticipated just a year ago. That is how quickly things are changing from the, our, our customer's perspective, the digital customer, um, and in the, the retail space today. You know, a, a year happens pretty quickly today, right? Any, anyone with kids will, will, will know how sort of a years tend to, tend to fly by. Um, and it's scary how quickly things are changing and how much we have to do in such a short time to keep up with these new empowered customers. And the reality is that, you know, in this new digital world, we have organisations that are born digital, the Amazons, the ASOSs, the, uh, the Iconics uh, here in Australia, uh, Catch of the Day, um, you know, uh, other you know, online companies, and some of the big online ones, particularly in China. Um, you know, these guys get digital, they, they grew up in the digital space. I, I will make the point that you know, certainly around some of the digital touch points, uh, such as mobile, um, many of these companies actually haven't really got their head around them yet, but they do get that their customers are digital. We then have those who are achieving digital mastery, and you know, I was, when I was looking at the, the company to, 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 to showcase here on this slide, the, the obvious one was Apple, right? That uh, you know, Apple has certainly embedded digital into you know, many of the, the, the touch points um, that within the, the customer process. You know, everything from you know, the, the purchasing process through to the, the service, the use, the ask process, and then going back into the, um, in, into the, the sales process uh, again with them. However, I guess I'd argue that Telstra in Australia is, is perhaps um, doing this sometimes even a little better. They've, uh, you know, they've certainly started to deploy beacons in their stores, integration between the, the mobile touch point and the retail points of presence. Um, their, their showcase stores in Sydney and Melbourne um, have you know, embedded digital very effectively to make that whole transaction better, to expose more information um, to, the, to the customer at that, at that point of sale um, so they can uh, at least be an informed customer. Um, they've embedded social into the experience, et cetera. So certainly um, you know, many, some traditional firms anyway are starting to reinvent themselves as, as uh, digital businesses. And then, of course, you know, the, the obligatory blockbuster, or here it is, the, the video easy slide here in Australia, the, the big video chain that uh, I think for the most part has, has closed down. Um, this is a photo of one of, the, one of the stores in my local area. Um, they're closing down sales, you know, hand painted, all, all stock must go. This is an organisation that you know, wasn't prepared for the transition to digital. Um, and, uh, you know, is obviously seeing that uh, <coughs> impact their business significantly. So digital is certainly happening, um, and, and omni-channel is happening. And you know, I, I look at the, the digital customer today. I look at you know, what is the, the typical experience when we board a flight, when we want to interact with an airline. And you know, uh, six months ago, it was the mobile app. Right? I'd go into my Qantas mobile app, I'd, I'd check in online um, you know, on, on that phone, and that would be my, my boarding pass. So even, you know, even the terminals in the airport, you know, the, that, that were relatively new and modern, you know, the, the people as terminals that Qantas and many airlines have deployed, 
you know, are starting to get a dust as, as, uh, as we're moving to these other digital touch points. And it's interesting, I made this comment about Qantas that six months ago, I, you know, I checked in on the, on, on the mobile app. Today I don't even do that. Today I get a text message from the airline saying, would you like to check in? I click a link, I hit accept, and I'm checked in. I, I, you know, now going to the, into the app seems like a lot of work for me. Right? But this is an airline that understands that you know, I, I live and breathe in, in these digital devices. Make it really easy for me. Um, you know, take the, the friction out of the process uh, for me to deal with you and interact with you as, a, as an organization. <coughs> now, our data shows, um, and this comes from some uh, survey research we've done in the US, although you know, the, the international data is pretty similar, it varies a little country by country, but around 52% of those store sales are influenced online. So our, our customers are coming into our stores you know, with a view of what they're going to buy um, more than half the time. Um, and interestingly, how quickly mobile is taking off, something that you know, wasn't really happening a few years ago, which is mobile commerce, is now you know, creeping up towards around 30% of our online sales are now from mobiles and tablets. So you know, uh, the customers are starting to you know, want to interact with us in the easiest way possible. And for many of them, that means you know, on the device that's in their pocket, in their bag, um, which is their smartphone or, or, or tablet device. So our, our customers have effectively become omni-channel. Right? Our, you know, our customers think of it as a brand that they want to deal with. Now, the way I say this, omni-channel is real in our customers' mind anyway, right? But they don't, our customers don't care where they make the transaction, right? And, and here we are as, as, as retailers. And you know, having worked in, in retail myself, you know, seeing the, um, the, you know, the, the web channel has its uh, sales target, the uh, retail channel has its sales target, you know, the, the, the different channels, these very siloed channels, have their sales target. And having worked in this space, you know, often the easiest way, in my experience, to, to hit your target was to actually take sales from other channels. Right? So you're not growing your organization's business. You're not growing their revenue. You're just you know, taking sales from another channel. Um, I actually had an experience working at a telco with this where um, we, we set up a, a direct sales force that were you know, the door-to-door the -door guys, um, basically, who go door-to-door -to, -door to sell mobile phones. And uh, they had some pretty good offers. They had offers which were actually better than the retail store. And so the smart ones, what they did, instead of the pain of going door to door and you know, wearing out the leather in their shoes, uh, they set up stalls outside of the mobile retail presence. And, and you know, someone would come to that store to buy a phone. Before they got to the store, they got stopped by someone wearing that, uh, that telco's uh, uniform and, and offered a better offer than they could get in the store a few metres away. Um, and, and this is the way we've set our organisations up. And as customers, we don't care. We just want to get the product or service. Right? Where that transaction occurs really is, is just not important to the customer. So we've already become omnichannel in the customer's mind. Um, and you can start to see that this is um, some, uh, some global survey data. <coughs> is that 73% of our customers already expect click and collect. That we expect that we can you know, order online, collect in store. We expect to be able to return online orders in the store. And we expect to view the in-store inventory of those products online. And then if I look at that last one in particular, that's something that I know in Asia where we're generally pretty weak at. Not many stores have really started exposing their uh, store inventory to their online presence. You know, too many say, you know, ring this number to find out if your store actually has this product. Um, so, you know, our customers are expecting this. For the most part, we're not really delivering this, this omni-channel experience to our customers. So how do we do this and, and how do we build the business case? Well, the, the reality is that omni-channel isn't a thing that we do. It's not a, you know, it's not, we, we don't flick a switch and sort of become an omni-channel organisation. Omni-channel is a lot of very separate tactical things that we do to serve the customer and for retailer A, it may be very different to retailer B to what they're doing. So ultimately what you do to build that business case is to understand that you know, when I do A, what, what is the opportunity for, for me as a retailer and what is the customer benefit around this particular thing? Um, I'm going to give a few examples here of, of organisations that have already done it. 
um, the endless aisle capability, right? This is the um, this, this is the piece where uh, your your sales associate in store has a, a mobile device or tablets where you know someone's trying on a pair of shoes or a shirt and they they like it but they just don't like it in that color and you don't have a stock of the of the color that they're after. Um, this is the ability to save the sale. This is the ability to say, well, you know, at our store in the next suburb, uh, we do have this stock. Um, you, you can go there and pick it up and we can sell it to you here, you can pick it up there, or we can ship it out to you, right? And this is, you know, um, UGG is, you know, UGG, the Australian sort of uh, UGG boot uh, manufacturer and retailer, um, has actually found that they've started some, some new concept stores. The store's are around 20 to 30% smaller than, than their traditional um, stores, so they're certainly saving on rent. And they're using this endless aisle concept to, to save the sale. Um, yeah, they, they know that you know, if people leave the store, even if they want that product, the thing that they're going to do is go onto the web or go into their mobile device and search for that product at the cheapest place they can find it. Right? And sometimes that won't be your own organization. So they will come into your store, you know, try it on the product, maybe even want to buy the product from you, but because you don't have it, because you don't have the stock, they'll go home and end up buying it from someone else. Um, so by en empowering their sales associates with this endless eye cap aisle capability, they've actually seen an uptick of sales of 20% in those stores um, where they've rolled that out so far. So you know, that is a very powerful piece. You know, that is you know, a small but powerful piece of, of, of omnichannel. Um, other pieces such as that buy online, pick up in store. Um, well, that you know that <coughs> the benefit to you is that uh, it has people coming into store, right? It has, you know the opportunity to sell more things to the person once they're in store. And if you have the right data about the person and can use that data effectively, then you know that certainly is an opportunity for you. Um, and and customers would see a benefit too that they go and they pick it up, um, maybe maybe do a quick upsell, but they're not having to. Um, you know, to, to, to walk through the store and spend a lot of time looking for what they want. The, the ship from store has its benefits. The um, in-store returns of online orders, right? Um, that certainly has a convenience to the customers. Um, I actually did that myself very recently when I uh, uh, ordered something when the retailer actually sent me the wrong product. Um, you know, it, it was nice to know that I could just return it in-store as opposed to having to go up to my local post office, send it off, um, and, and wait for that refund to happen. Um, there are tier two capabilities. These are the ones that are, are, are sometimes a bit more complex, sometimes a bit further away when it comes to uh, omnichannel. Um, the ship to locker, which in some countries in region, uh, that capability is already available, but not certainly available everywhere. Um, the access to the vendor source inventory, so being able to showcase you know, your entire supplier's catalog online um, and perhaps ship directly from the vendor um, to your customer. You know, certainly that, you know, you, you can see certainly the benefit of that to um, one of your customers that you know, keeps them on the store, gives you a greater range, more things to sell. Um, you know, and so you start to build those business cases around these very specific, um, you know, uh, omni-channel capabilities. And you roll it out piece by piece. <coughs> An important point to notice, however, is that, or uh, an important point to be aware of anyway, is that too often when we do this, we start to think a bit tactically, right? We, 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 we start to think of um, you know, the endless aisle and we go and we find the vendor or supplier who can help us with our endless aisle capability. And then the, the ship from store, we find a supplier that has that add-on capability and we start to buy all these point solutions. And then when we try to bring them together and have that total view of the customer and you know, offer a consistent experience with the customer, Sometimes we find out that these pieces of software don't integrate with each other, or it's a pain. You know, it's a significant undertaking from our IT department, you know, to spend time integrating these solutions. So uh, being a little more strategic when you start to think omnichannel, when you start to make your investments, um, you know, when you start to think that, well, I'm going to do this now, but in future what I like to do is, you know, C, D, and E. How about we start to look at a platform that can support all of these capabilities? Um, I'm not saying that is the right strategy for everyone. Sometimes, you know, best of breed does make more sense. Uh, but, you know, understand that there will be those integration challenges uh, if you do go down that approach. And certainly make the recommendation that if you can find a platform that can 
help you with a lot of the omnichannel experience that's going to uh, ease your pain uh, in the medium and longer term. So how does digital create opportunities in, in, this, in, in the retail world? Well, I guess first of all, let's, well, let's have a step back and think, well, what does digital mean to you as a business? And it means two different things. Um, too often when we think about digital, we do tend to think about the smartphones, uh, you know, we tend to think about digital customer experience. Um, as what we're trying to offer. But the reality is that we need to go through a change ourselves as businesses ourselves. We have to become digital businesses. We have to start to, and I'll, I'll be making this point a number of other times throughout this presentation, is that we have to start to break down the silos inside our own business um, the way we think. We, you know, often we think of digital as a, a channel for the customer as opposed to digital as you know, a touch point that you know, should be throughout every channel um, every customer interaction. Um, I, an example I like to give a lot is that example of you know, it'd be great in IKEA if you could you know, scan a product and find out if it's available and um, pick up that, you know, uh, it, that maybe a mobile app direct you to that product um, you know, in, in the warehouse. But you know, what I'd personally as an IKEA customer find more useful is that when I get home, I'd like to be able to scan that barcode and it showed me a video of, of how to put that product together as opposed to that annoying instruction manual that they give you. Um, I'd like to have an, uh, you know, a button in the app that says there's a part missing, click this button and we'll automatically send it out to you. Uh, that's putting digital throughout that whole customer experience, throughout that whole customer journey, and that often involves um, significant changes to the way we operate as a business and significant changes to our back-end systems. Um, so retailers have to do the following things, and I'll go through each one of these uh, point by point. So I won't spend too much time on this slide. Um, first of all, we need to, as I made that point, become a digital business. And that involves more than just, you know, you know selling on smartphones and, and selling on the web and supporting our customers, you know, throughout the sales process. It's about changing the culture of our business. It's about changing the metrics. As, as I said, in, instead of having the, the channels compete against each other, it's about how can the channels work together to drive a better customer experience so the customers actually want to come back to us and interact with us again, because that's when the opportunity of digital is going to be. Um, you know, it involves you know, significant changes to your technology, sometimes not significant investments, but sometimes some integrations uh, of, of existing systems that might not be working together. Um, and changes to sometimes even the structure of your organisation. Um, as I said, too many of us are, you know, already have those silos where we're structured by you know, uh, the, the retail, um, the, the call centre, you know, web, etc. Um, and often it's about bringing those together um, to make sure that all those capabilities offer that uh, um, delightful customer experience, as I like to say. Uh, digital, you know, the, the benefits of digital and smartphones in particular is they really start to help you break down those friction points in the customer life cycle. So that example I gave with IKEA, you know, putting the product together, constructing that product uh, when I get home, that for me is a significant friction point uh, with IKEA. That's the bit that frustrates me that where I see digital can make a significant impact in my satisfaction. You know, it's that bit that stops me going back there the next time um, until I eventually find myself back there again somehow. Um, so, you know, uh, it's these digital pieces that can help us, you know, uh, you know turn our in-store experience around from a you know, data collection into, you know, into an analytic experience where we can empower our associates with the right data um, to drive the right outcome for our customers at, at each point in that um, customer journey. And this associate adoption is really mission critical. I, I can't emphasize this enough. I know organizations that have rolled out Endless Isle. I know retailers that have rolled out, rolled out beacons and had significant failures because of the fact they didn't take the associates on the journey. You know, the reality is that in retail, many of your associates, many of the people working the shop floor are, are not people who are committed to your organization. They're, they're school students, they're uni students, um, particularly on the, on the weekends and the busy times. Um, but they're often not full-time staff. They're often people, you know, looking to, you know, earn a living as they're, as they're studying and, <coughs> or, or earn a living as a, as a second income perhaps in their family. And so 
the reality is that unless these people are given the right training, given the right tools, you know, taken on the journey, show how they could change that experience. So let's use that UGG experience, right, where they are doing the end of file. You know, you know, when that customer says, well, I really like that colour, um, and you find out that they're not available in store, that sales associate has to act differently than they would today, right? Uh, that sales associate has to actively, you know, uh, you know, pull out their tablet, look at the availability, you know, try to save the sale. It has to be, and you know, we have to measure them on that trying to save the sale piece. Um, you know, that involves different metrics for us, but certainly involves a, a different way that we start to train and work with our associates, and we start to realise how important these guys are in, uh, you know, in differentiating us in this uh, in this digital era. Uh, but, you know, one of the big challenges, and I'll talk in this in a little more detail when I get into the beacons piece, is that is the fact that we're collecting a lot of data. We have a lot of data in our businesses today. But you know, you know, many of us are you know, drowning in data. You know, we've got all the information we want, but none of the insights that help us actually do anything differently. And so we certainly need that. And for many of us, this really should be nearly a starting point of, of where we start to think about digital first is, well, you know, when we start collecting this data, what can we do differently with it? You know, and let's start you know, thinking about that first before we jump head first into this, uh, you know, into this omnichannel and digital world. And I'm going to give you an example of an organisation that is using insights to, to not only serve their customers effectively, but to break down the existing retail model. So this is a company called Stitch Fix. They're a US organisation. They, uh, they only sell to females at the moment. Uh, and you log onto their website and you, you can't see their store. Uh, you can't see what they sell. What you do is you fill in a questionnaire about yourself. You give them information and they use that information to work out what they think you will like, basically, based off what other similar people to you liked, um, what other people in your area liked, what other people in your region, in your, you know, of your age, of your socio-demographic background, etc. And you know, they use all that information to, you know, to, to um, and, and they also put some human um, piece in this too. It's not just um, automated decisions. They certainly are, are trying to add that human touch into this, uh, uh, into this too to make sure that you know that you're getting the latest fashion and not uh, and not you know, stuff from two or three years ago, um, which sometimes that's what the data will show you what people bought two or three years ago, right? So the humans certainly help to keep that data relevant and, and up to date, which is obviously important in the fashion space. And then what they do is they send you five items. You, they, you don't give them any money. You give them your credit card, but you don't give them any money. And then you choose to keep what you think works best for you. Right? And if they do it well, you know, you, you might end up wanting to keep all five and you pay for all five items and there's certainly a, uh, they give you a 25% discount, I believe, if you do keep all five items, um, which is clever from, from that perspective. Uh, so <coughs> now, if they get this right, this changes the whole retail game, right? Because suddenly, you know, it comes to winter in Australia and you as a customer go online and say, send me a new winter wardrobe. You know, that, that is your shopping experience with them. Right? And they send you items and you send them back the ones you don't like and you keep the ones you do. Right? And, and you trust that you know, this person will and this organisation with their data and with that personal touch will, will keep you, you know, looking great, hopefully. Um, so this is an organisation really embedding data into the way that they make decisions and in the way that they serve their customers. And that's, you, know, you start to see how data can start to not only you know, disrupt the market but create whole new business opportunities. Uh, for organisations. Um, I've made the point already that uh, you, know, you will have existing systems in place. You will have to integrate them. You, know, um, you, know, you, you will be looking to buy new technologies and bring them in. So your new technologies are going to have to work with your existing investments. You know, certainly some organisations, like some, you know, the, the ones Bianca was talking about earlier, some of them have actually made the decision that you know, they, they, the best of breed approach didn't work for them. Uh, and they're moving to this platform-based approach um, and adding to that platform and turning on new capabilities as required. Again, I'm not saying that's right for everyone. The point is that, um, and that is obviously a big thing to replace uh, a lot of the platforms that your organisation already has. But the reality is that you know, you're not going to do a lot of what you uh, want to do today with your existing technologies. So making sure that they integrate and work is important. And the final point I make is don't be creepy. 
uh, you know, often a lot of the business cases we hear around beacons, etc., involve people walking into stores and being identified by their phone and someone coming up and saying, I saw you on our website last night and you, and you looked at this product. We've got a special discount just for you today. Yeah, some customers might like that and some might think it's creepy. But I guess I'd make the point is don't uh, underestimate how much uh, privacy, inf privacy people are willing to forego for convenience and we certainly have shown that in the social world. Um, you know, I've got plenty of examples from my own lives and my friends' lives where we've you know, given up significant amounts of our own personal information to, for a $5 savings here or for free internet there. Um, so you don't underestimate our ability to do that. But you know, uh, understand that some customers might be creepy. Understand that for some of them it might be opt-in. Some of them understand that you know, maybe you target these features at your younger customers, not your older ones, or, or, your, or the females, not the males, or et cetera. You know, understanding who they are, what they're likely to use, and um, you know, don't, you know, don't creep them out, because we certainly have the capability uh, to, to do that with all the data that we're starting to gather, particularly as we move into the Internet of Things. So what's holding back this innovation today, and what's the challenge for retailers? Well, a very simple one is we often just don't have connectivity. Right? We, we speak to the stores that are rolling out the as-a-service solutions, um, and a lot of us now, I spoke to one in the US a few weeks ago who they're a, uh, they auction off secondhand cars. This is a, a very big organization that has you know, 250,000 cars on their, on their books at any one time. They sell 50,000 of them a week. And they found that their car lots just don't have connectivity, not even mobile connectivity in a lot of, you know, in, in certain black spots in their car lots. So getting connectivity into store, you know, on, onto your lot, in, in, into where you need it to enable either your customers or your associates or both, um, or, or even into your warehouse, right, um, you know, is an important part of it. And sometimes that involves, you know, rethinking your, uh, your whole networking strategy to start with. Um, I, I made the point already, I'll dig a, bit, a little bit deeper into this already, but our current retail systems in store are about collecting information. They are not about you know, um, you know, uh, engagement. They're not about helping the customer. They're not about helping the associate, right? They're about collecting information, storing that information, and, you know, and, and making sure the sale goes through effectively. So if we want to change that in-store experience, we are going to have to make you know, significant changes to our in-store systems um, and the way our in-store systems you know, interact with our customers and our, and our associates. <coughs> and this challenge is that our in-store systems, even when we start to turn them around and make them customer and associate focused, often you know, it's the next challenge is we have to make them you know, real time, right? You know, we can't find out after the customers left the store that we should have offered them this product based on um, something that they were uh, looking at or, or thinking of, of buying. So we need to start to leverage real time data and we need to point that into our stores. And you know, many of us have made significant investments in analytics and big data. Um, but often that's been based around our marketing teams and our advertising teams and you know, running better campaigns. Um, you know, many of us haven't yet turned that round to an associate or, or customer focused initiative. And this is this point again, which I'll, I'll keep going on about this, is that we are still siloed in retail. Many of us you know, still sit within you know, the, the store team, the web team. Um, we have targets that are siloed. Um, and it's hard to you know, it, it's hard to start to become a digital organisation if we have different parts of the business fighting against each other. So, you know, we need common sets of issues across the channels. We need alignment. Again, we need to change these organisational KPIs um, to become that customer-obsessed organisation in the digital era. So, um, moving on to the technologies that are going to support this digital customer experience. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> but I'll make the point that it's not just our channels to market that are siloed. And I said early on that I'm going to hammer this last five point uh, quite a bit. It, it is our whole business, right? It, it is, it's not just channels, it is our whole business that is siloed. If you look at the way we've built the systems around our customer journey, uh, the systems that help our customers discover, explore, buy, use, engage, and then ask um, our, our organisation, themselves are different systems. Our different customer touch points 
often sit in different silos in the organization. So our technology silos in our business are really getting in the way of us offering that consistent digital customer experience. So ultimately what we need to do is build this, what, what we call a digital experience platform. And I'm going to start with, I guess, a generic view. This is the every organization, retailers, you know, uh, manufacturers, you know, every organization view of this digital experience platform. And, uh, and then I'll dig a little bit in, deeper into what that retail experience might look like. But basically you're going to start with these touch points. Now, how are our customers wanting to interact with each other? We want to think about how we deliver that contextual experience on the glass at those touch points. And that contextual experience might be location based, it might be time based, it might be based on who they are as a customer, it might be based on the weather. You know, there are many different things that might impact what that experience might look like. And we need that platform in our business to contextualize what is coming out of our marketing platforms, our commerce platforms, our service platforms, customer data content, you know, all, all the other things that we're doing in our business. We're going to need an analytics platform across this to, to provide that contextual experience for our customers. And we're going to need the ability to bring in data from outside of our organization. Because in this new digital world, we might, you know, we might find that we're taking third party data um, to improve the experience. Or we might find that we are the third party data in someone else's customer experience. Right? Um, I certainly know in some countries in Asia in particular, the approach to mobility is that, you know, as a retailer, you don't build an app. You, you go to where the customers are, and the customers might be on that messaging service or the social media, Facebook, whatever it is, service. You, know, you go to them, you embed yourself into someone else's platform, you become that third-party data feed into someone else's platform, and that is how you effectively service your digital customers. So what does that look like from that retail experience? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, we're going to start with our back-end systems. They're not going away. We're not talking about this. This new digital experience platform isn't talking about replacing, ripping and replacing all these back-end systems. Not, not straight away anyway. But it, again, it's starting with that, you know, what is that associate touch point? What is that customer touch point? You know, what is the experience we want them to have? How do we make that experience better by embedding digital into that experience? And this is where we start embedding that you know, digital experience platform in there. Um, the web content management, the personalization, merchandising, um, the transaction engines, product information management, all these different pieces of the platform that become relevant to, you know, to, to help us guide that uh, personalized experience um, and that, you know, that contextual experience for our customers. Um, we're going to have digital store systems, and these are going to be many of the new technologies that we roll out. To be honest, if you look at those, you know, the, the stuff in blue here, many of this already exists in our organisations, just a lot of it doesn't work together that well. Um, we're going to have to have these digital store systems that are going to be gathering data, feeding them back into this customer experience platform, which will feed back into our, you know, our loyalty and our supply chain and customer platforms, and, and then going back up through those systems and providing that contextual delivery to our customers um, on their you know, chosen touch point or that associate touch point. Um, and you know, we're going to, again, need the ability to take that third party data into our, into our systems. You know, I, I like to, you know, I, I give an example. I, you know, when I first got my first Fitbit, um, it had sleep, you know, it, the Fitbit had sleep tracking. And this was uh, sort of two or three years ago when they, when they first bought them out. I was an early adopter of the technology. Um, and, and I looked at it and went, you know, they're tracking my sleep. I, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could walk into a mattress store, a bed store, and they could tell me that based on my age, maybe my weight, maybe my you know, gender, um, a, a few factors about me, they could tell me that people of, of my type you know, sleep best on this mattress. And they can point to that data coming from the Fitbit devices and other wearable devices um, that help, you know, that, that drive that, um, you know, that, that information, that analytics and help me make a you know, database decision about uh, which mattress I'll, I'll buy. Um, <coughs> and, you know, and, and I'll look at that and go, you know, that, that involves me as a, as, a, you know, a, as a bed store or a mattress retailer being able to take that feed of that data, um, being able to understand and, and uh, you know, being able to link into those API into those third party systems. Uh, and you know, obviously that is 
very much the tip of the iceberg when it comes to wearables and that broader internet of things and the sort of data that it may provide. You know, I, you know, I, I look at the fact that you know, an energy retailer to a smart meter would be able to tell me if my customers are at home in the evening or not, right? They could tell me that you know, males or females of a certain age group you know, obviously, this is the creepy factor. I, I probably don't want my electricity manufacturer, my electricity retailer, telling people when I'm home and not. But they can see by energy using or, or usage on average when, where, and when their customers are. So therefore, you know, when I'm designing my campaigns, I know that you know males of a certain age are more likely to be home in the evening. So maybe sell them comfort clothes. You know, females of a certain age are more likely to be out in the evening. So they're you know you know do campaigns to them that are that have clothes for, for going out in, right? So they start to use this Internet of Things data to, to make better decisions um, to drive the, the right outcomes for our customers. Um, <coughs> in terms of the specific technologies uh, and what their relevance is today, there are a couple of things that we need to really start thinking about today. Now, NFC you know, or you know, uh, touchless payments is certainly happening in Australia, happening in a few other countries around the region. Um, no, we don't have you know um, Apple Pay yet. Um, I think you know that, that I believe that that'll get pretty slow adoption because we already have the you know the touchless payments um, in in a lot of these countries anyway. Where you know for the US, you know Apple Pay was really you know the, the first entry point into touchless payments um, for many retailers and many customers. Um, so that's already happening. You know, we need to start thinking about that. We probably need to have a bit of a strategy of whether or not we adopt and embrace Apple Pay and the Google Pay uh, capability, Google Wallet capabilities you know, when they are more readily available in our country. Uh, beacons is an interesting point. You know, beacons are real, they're happening. Telstra is using them today. Um, other organisations across the world are starting to use them. Again, unless you train your sales staff effectively and um, your associates, you know, they're, they're not going to know what to do with that information and they're not going to be able to do anything with it. Um, and unless you have a strategy of what you do with that data. So this is again that point of if you, you, know, you need that strategy, you need to be collecting the data, know what different actions you can help your customers and your associates take with that data before you start to roll out these types of capabilities. And I know in the US I've seen organisations roll out beacons and then uh, switch them off because of that issue that they didn't have that ability to do anything different with that, that information. Something that's taking off not yet in Australia, but we're certainly seeing US and European uh, retailers kick it off, is this idea of the magic mirror. You know, that, that in a change room, you know, and this is a real technology today, in a change room there is a, an interactive mirror that, you know, that understands what you're trying on based on perhaps that tag um, uh, on, that, uh, on that item, and can make suggestions. Uh, what we've seen one retailer I spoke to in the US um, a few weeks ago was actually telling me that 20% uh, of customers, I think it was 20 or 30% of their customers, um, you know, because let's say you're trying on a, a new pair of trousers or a dress or a, you know, a, a shirt, you know, this mirror will make a suggestion, do you know that these shoes might look good with that or this belt, et cetera. And it's, I can't remember, it was 20 or 30% of customers were calling the associate and asking them to bring that item in, into that change room. So that is certainly something that you should start to be exploring today. Um, that is a real technology. It is making a difference to, to sales and is uh, certainly increasing the, 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 the per store sales in those organisations that do it effectively. Uh, technologies that are you know, starting to happen, um, you know, that, or, or that you should be at least thinking about, um, you know, uh, having a strategy for when they become more commonly available. It's things like that, the RFID tags to enhance the marketing and merchandising. Um, you know, perhaps video conferencing in stores or shared displays, facial scanning for personalization, wearable technology, um, smart, you know, uh, smart countertops, et cetera. Again, Telstra has, has rolled out those smart countertops quite effectively, but you know, not in every store that was a significant investment and, and, and much of that was to showcase the technology as much as anything else. So, so whilst that technology might be real, you know, for the most part, this stuff isn't really ready for the mainstream. Um, but you certainly need to have a strategy about what you do with it. And this is this idea that if you start to think omnichannel, start to think about what you might do with these pieces and can the platforms you choose and the point products you choose 
support some of these capabilities when they do start to roll out. And then something, uh, you know, I'll put them in here basically to say, don't worry about them too much is, you know, 3D printing, um, you know, it will take over the world eventually, but, you know, that's uh, more than probably five to 10 years away. Um, and then freeing up, uh, you know, associates time with robots in store. Again, you know, there are people doing it today. It's, it's, a, it's a real technology, um, but it is a, a fair way away from mainstream, particularly here in Asia. Um, and this is just a bit of a, a, a visual as to when to start to pay attention and when to start to, you know, just start to work out the market applicability to think, you know, is, is this relevant to me? Do I need to start thinking about it? Does it need to be part of my strategy today, particularly for my technology strategy? So finishing off with uh, just a couple of slides on building that, that uh, digital customer experience roadmap, is, uh, this is the sort of uh, no-brainer slide of that, well, here's what you do. You, know, you have your current state, you have your future state, and, and you build a roadmap of how you get there. You, know, you, you need to understand why you want to be there. Um, you know, as, as a client I was speaking to just last night actually was saying, um, you know, they're trying to understand you know, what does best look like. Right, that, that was the way they put it. And, and they, they are going to build a future of that best retail experience um, for their customers, for what they sell, um, and, you know, and are then going to build that roadmap as to how they get to that point in time. And these are some of the questions that you can start to ask about building that roadmap and, uh, and, you know, and, and how you, uh, you, know, you get to that final end point. Um, you know, first of all, it's about that cross-role team, you know, for your discovery piece of, you know, who are the stakeholders? Who do we need to include in this conversation? You know, I suggest that you have associates in there. You know, the in-store people have got to be part of the conversation because they're the ones who really understand what's going on. Uh, the people on your telephones, you know, a answering the customer complaints, they've got to be part of that conversation too. Um, you know, what, what does that strategy look like? You know, how are we going to get there? <coughs> What should the metrics be for our organisation? How would we like to measure ourselves in this new world? You know, and you know, all, all, our, all of Forrester's suggestions are certainly around, you've got to be measuring yourself on the customer experience. That is all that counts. Right? If you can deliver that great customer experience, then customers will come back to you and you will be a more profitable organisation. You know, obviously, you know, sales and revenue and profits is all part of that, uh, part of those metrics. But you know, having customer experience at the center of that, having customer experience driving your decisions um, will certainly uh, help to clarify um, many of the, the, the strategies that you have. You know, understanding your technology, you know, uh, understanding you know, what you have today, uh, you know, what, what the gaps are, where you'd like to get to. Uh, I won't go into that in, in too much detail. I've talked about some of the technology already. Um, but you know, you know, these aren't just the you know, your back-end technologies, but they'll be all those uh, marketing technologies that might help you do a bit of A-B testing. Um, and I certainly know organisations in retail that are starting to do this. I've seen organisations roll out different features on Android versus iOS as, as a way of doing A-B testing um, to work out, you know, which way, what, what are the features we want? Um, what are the features that are more popular with our customers? And then the next version might switch off or switch on um, some of those capabilities on those competing platforms. Um, you know, w work out that plan of rolling out that technology. What do we need to do first? In that, you know, in that move to omnichannel, what are the bits that are going to make the biggest difference for us and for our customers? <coughs> and then you build that business case, right? And that's, you know, once you start to get an idea of all the things you need to do, well, you can build that business case. Once you've started to test those ideas and having that part of your business and maybe you know, maybe that thing is you have a, a, a specific store where you test a few ideas and um, where you try some things out for customers. Well, I know some organisations that are testing, some retailers that are testing technology with customers today that aren't even real, right? But they, they're doing mock-ups, basically, to work out is, is this something that a customer might respond to that might help their interaction. Um, and, you know, and, and they then use that data from those very simple tests that they do, those low cost tests that they run, to help them build that business case, to help them understand, you know, because m much of this is speculative. Sometimes it's hard to build these business cases. Having that, you know, innovation capability in our organisation to very simply and quickly test ideas, 
to give us the data to build our business cases is certainly an important part of moving very quickly and, you know, and uh, start starting to build the case for these new digital customer experience capabilities. Um, so that's where I'm going to end my session today. Um, I'm hoping you got something useful out of it. I'm um, hoping you've got an idea of the, the challenges of your organisation. Hope you're, hopefully you're a little bit excited about the things that digital will do for your organisation and, and what the opportunities are for, for your company and your, as a retailer to compete more effectively and to win more business. Uh, so now we'll be opening up to a Q&A session. Sure. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press the pound or hash key. To submit a question online via web panel, please type your questions in the Q&A box located on the bottom right of your screen. Thank you. I actually have a couple of questions coming in on the um, Q&A panel here. Um, the first one is from Michelle, and Michelle asks, what strength do traditional retailers have in the digital world when competing against the online retailers? Uh, now, that's, that, that's actually a really good question. Um, you know, the, the online guys, you know, the, the data is showing both here in Asia and globally, you know, online is becoming a much bigger part of the, of the, the retail pie. Um, and that they are you know, taking significant market share uh, away from you know, the, the traditional retailers. I honestly see digital as a way of the traditional retailers fighting back. You know, I, I use that endless aisle example. You know, what, you know, what does your customer do when they can't buy their product in store? You know, they've already made the, the effort to come into your store to look for a product, um, to try on a product, you know, and then you don't have it in their size or you don't have it in the colour that they want. You know, so what do they do? As I made the point already, they go home and they, 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 they do a search online and I'll probably buy it from someone that's cheaper than you, right? Because they've already tried it on, they know their size. Um, you know, if you can save that sale, you know, A, you have a happy customer, they, they walk away with a product. You know, B, you might have made an upsell with them too, right? That you, know, that you've, uh, that, that you might have sold them a pair of socks with those shoes too, for example, or, um, or some insoles that they've tried on in store that are better than the, the ones that come in that shoe. So you know, I see digital as you know, the, 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 the digital retailer um, the digital omni-channel retailer as you know the, the big comeback for the traditional retailers. You know the, the chance to buy online and pick up in store, which you can't do when you're an online retailer. Um, you know the, the chance to enhance that that customer experience by using data more effectively. Um, <coughs> you know the, the opportunity to personalise that experience, which again is that that little bit more difficult to do when you're a an, an online retailer. So. Um, you know, I, I see that you know digital will, you know, di digital you know, digital retail experience is certainly that chance for these guys to fight back. You know, I, I'm seeing too many of them, you know, in Australia in particular, not do it very well so far. Um, that you know that they're still nearly 10 years behind in their strategy. You know, they're they're still not taking online and mobile seriously. But on the flip side of that, I'm seeing that some of the, um, you know, that 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 actually, you know, that the best mobile experiences in retail today come from traditional retailers. You know, I, I'd say this is where the online retailers are a fair way behind that they're still too, too heavily thinking about the web. Um, they're not embedding mobile into that, uh, that full customer experience. So you know, there certainly is a significant opportunity um, you know, for them and I, you know, I, I, I think Omnichannel is this, uh, you know, the, the, the great saviour of, of many of the bricks and mortar, the mortar retailers. Um, but it will change them, right? As you know, I'm doing 20% smaller stores, you know, because of these new digital capabilities. Your stores will look and feel different. You'll re you'll lay out your stores differently from the data that you have of how customers walk around your store, right? You, you'll understand what items retailers are looking at, right? And this is one of the benefits of web over store, right? Is that you know, you, web, you know exactly what they're looking at. Store, all you know is that certain people came in and certain people left. Um, and you made certain sales where, you know, these new digital capabilities are starting to let people see, you know, where people are spending time in the store, what products are they standing in front of, um, how you can, you know, lay out your store more effectively to, uh, you know, to, to drive more sales and, and greater customer satisfaction. 
Thank you. I think we have time for one more question and then we have to cut it off and answer all the other questions following the webinar. So the last question here um, on the web is um, from Dean and he asks, where should I start my journey to becoming a digital store? So, um, you know, I, I sort of made the point that you need good data, right? You know, you, you, sorry, you, you don't need good data. You need to know what you're going to do with good data. So you need good analytics. Um, that is a capability your organisation will need. Where you start the journey from a customer experience perspective, though, is mobile. You know, this is the biggest change going on today. Your customers are mobile. Our data is showing, you know, we have some really good data from Australia around the region and, uh, and around the world, is showing how people are using mobile in store. And there's really good news that, you know, I think the data was something like 50% of sales made in store on mobile are made from that particular retailer, right? You know, this is, you know, so, so you know, you are actually empowering your customers. The ones who pull out their smartphone, around half of them could be buying a product from you on that smartphone, right? And this is where you see, you know, you start to really see the opportunities for things like Android Style. Is that, you know, they're doing it because that stock probably wasn't available uh, in store. Um, so starting with mobile, starting with embedding mobile into that customer experience. Mobile isn't a channel. And mobile has, we, we talk about the mobile moments of customers. Um, understand how you can help them in their mobile moments. Now, as a retailer, one of the most important mobile moments you have is when your customers walk into a competitor's store. Right? What are you doing on their smartphone when that happens? Right? That's, you know, that is a mobile moment where you can change the equation, where you can get them back to your own store, where you can steal the sale. That's how powerful mobile is. There's, a, there's there are retailers around the world already doing this that have their mobile app set to offer discounts when you walk into a competitor store, not when you walk into their store. Right? But to get the discount, you have to get back to, you know, you have to leave the competitor store, right? So, so mobile is where you should be starting. You know, mobile is the, the, the piece of technology sitting in everyone's pockets that is changing the world today. Mobile is the first platform for nearly every one of your customers. Um, and for the ones that it's not today, in a couple of years, it will be. So get your mobile strategy worked out. Think of the mobile moments of your customers. Think of how you can serve them. And this isn't just about sales. This is about when they get the product home. This might be registering the product. This might be asking a question to your staff. This might be online chat. You know, there, there are many, many different mobile moments. This might be delivery, showing where, your, where the delivery person is, how far they're away, which helps me as a customer know, can I nick out to the shops and get something? No. The delivery person's you know, in a couple of k's away. Um, I'm not going to try that now. These are the mobile moments that help me, that keep me happy and satisfied as a customer, and that make me want to come back and deal with that uh, retailer again. So that is certainly where you should be starting your journey. Thank you, Tim. And uh, if there are no more questions on the audio, then um, we conclude the webinar for today. So thank you, Tim, for being our guest speaker today. And Thank you everyone for your time and attending the webinar today. The webinar recording and the slides will be sent out shortly. Thank you everyone.